Amen. So it's great to be here at Steadfast Baptist Church in Oklahoma. Um, was been real excited about coming out here and meeting you folks. Uh, real excited about seeing new churches like this springing up. Um, <clears throat> it's great to come into a church where, you know, we all have, kind of have the same uh, same goal. I, you know, the first thing I notice is that that big map there. And that's such an encouragement to walk into a church and say that that's you know that's the focus of this church. So. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know, I'm, uh, my name is Brother Corbin Russell. I'm from uh, Phoenix there. I've been a member of Faithful Word Baptist Church for six years. I've been the deacon there for coming up on a year. Uh, so I, I've, been, I've been there for a little while and uh, I'm doing a lot of preaching down in the Tucson area. We've got a plant kind of like this one. This is what I really appreciate about this is we have a, a plant of similar size. I, I don't know that our building is quite as nice as your guys'. I'm, I feel like our chairs are, are right there with your chairs. you got some good chairs, but... Uh, uh, so I, you know, I can relate a lot to this church, uh, you know, being a, a satellite church of sorts, and uh, I'm just excited to be here and preach for you folks. So let's just get in the message this morning. Uh, of course, First Chronicles chapter 13 is a very familiar passage. Uh, this is where David's bringing back the ark. If you recall, the ark had been taken away and had been in the land of the Philistines, and then they tried to send it back, and it, it didn't quite make it. We won't go into all of that. But David here in First Chronicles 13, he's setting out to do a really good thing. I don't think anybody here would argue with the fact that what David is trying to do is a good thing. He says there in verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 3, excuse me, let us bring again the ark of our God to us. So David here, he's trying to do something good. He's got the right motives. And, you know, really David in this chapter, you can see he's anticipating this to be a great day. He's saying this is going to be a great day. We're doing a good thing. We're bringing back the ark of the house of God. And it says there in verse 5, so David called all, the, uh, all Israel together. He wants everybody to be there. He wants them to see this great day. He's got really high expectations of how this day is going to go. And of course, we know the story here in verses 9 and 10. Things go very badly <clears throat> where it says, And when they came under the threshing full of, of Kidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died before God. So, you know, got to imagine the... the the roller coaster of emotions that David must have gone through on this day. I mean, he's thinking that everything's going to go great. We've got everybody here to watch this. And the next thing you know, poor Uzzah, you know, is laying there on the ground dead. You know, he's, he's, he's uh, going through this, uh, you know, these unexpected emotions. These things kind of came out of the blue for him, I'm sure, I'm sure. So rather than going out and experiencing a great day, you know, these high emotions, he's actually experiencing very negative feelings at this point. You can imagine how David must feel. In fact, it tells us how David feels there. It says in verse 11, and David was displeased. You know, he's downhearted. He, this is not what, how he expected things to go. He was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Uh, therefore, that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day. So here's David starting out thinking, this is going to be a great day. There's a lot of joy. There's a lot of gladness. But how does the day end? Fear, displeasure, downheartedness, disappointment. And... <clears throat> You know, we read this story, and sometimes you know, we have to be careful when we, we don't charge God foolishly here. You say, well, why would God just kill Uzzah for touching the ark? Well, because the Bible makes it very clear that nobody else was supposed to touch that ark. And we'll see that here later in the story. But, <clears throat> you know, before we, before we charge God foolishly or, or get a bad attitude, say, well, I don't think that was fair. You know, this is kind of just a side note. You know, we should consider, you know, the poor timing of David's question here. What I mean by that, if you look at verse 12... He, and David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? You know, that would have been a good question to ask before you, you did this. That would, that would have been the appropriate time to ask that question. How is this to be done? And unfortunately, David doesn't do that, but it did get him thinking, didn't it? <clears throat> so David eventually does accomplish this task, we know if, we, if we know the story. He does eventually accomplish the task, and he gets to experience that great joy uh, and thrill that he was probably anticipating uh, on this day. But if you would turn over to keep something there in First Chronicles. We're going to be in First Chronicles right in this area for a bit. And uh, if you go over to First Chronicles chapter 15, First Chronicles chapter 15, it says in verse 25, So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up uh, the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. So, you know, verse, or chapter 13, we see this great disappointment. But then we see him succeed over here in, in chapter 15. So David does get to accomplish this goal. He does get to experience this joy, this joy. But really what's happening in verse 15, where it says that they brought him up out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy, 
You know, my, my thought is this, is that David is probably experiencing even more joy than he would have orig originally. Because jo he got to experience not only joy of, seeing, of doing a great work for God, bringing back the Ark of the Covenant to the house of Israel, but also he had to experience the joy of actually getting right with God. And that's what I want to preach to you about this morning, the joy of getting right. Whether it be getting right with God, getting right with another uh, person, whoever it might be, there is joy when we start to do things right. When we, when, we, when we get the sin out of our life, when we start doing the bad things or the wrong things, and we start to do things the right way, you know, there's a sense of joy that should come with that. And I believe that's what David's experiencing here. And we see David, he, you know, he made a failure. It cost somebody, you know, dearly. He's very downhearted. But then later he gets to accomplish that goal after he gets right. And now not as only accomplishing a great work, but he's also experiencing the joy of having gotten right with God. <clears throat> so... Now, here's the thing about this. We, of course, everybody in the room probably, you know, wants to experience joy. Nobody in here, you know, I would think is probably just, you know, looking to get, uh, you know, beat themselves up and just be a downhearted, you know, individual. Everyone here wants to experience this joy in their life. And, and, but here's the thing. If, 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 if we want to experience that joy, there's a process that we have to go through. You know, it, so, it sounds really easy just to say, hey, you need to get right with God. But there's a process behind that. You know, yeah, we want the joy. We want the peace. We want... Uh, all of that that comes with getting right with God, but you have to understand that in order to do that, you have to go through a process of getting right. You can't just say, well, I'm sorry, and that's it, and all of a sudden I've got the joy of the Lord again. You have to actually go do some things. There's some, some action, some steps that you have to take. So, and, and, you know, right out of the gate, you know, this is only going to work for somebody who has a tender heart. You know, the process of getting right is not for a stiff-necked person. The process of getting right is for a tender-hearted individual. Amen. The stiff-necked person will not get right. That's why they're stiff-necked. And that's, that's uh, if you would, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, a very familiar verse, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. See, the, the, the stiff-necked individual, they're not going to get right because they're stiff-necked, and there's not going to be any joy. In fact, it's going to be the opposite. There's going to be destruction, and there will be no remedy. Amen. <clears throat> now, it says over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you would, look there. Uh, actually, just turn in there. Now, let me just, before I get into this, let me just clarify by saying this. Uh, what I'm not saying this morning is that you can just do all the bad things. So you can just go, get, you know, get out of sorts with God, and, there's not, and as long as at the end of the day you get right, that there's no consequences. You know, there are still going to be consequences for sin. You know, Uzzah here that died in this chapter, Uzzah, you know, wasn't resurrected. You know, that family still went out without that father. Yeah. You know, that husband was gone. Yeah. That son was gone. So there are still consequences. So I don't, you know, I want to clarify that. I don't want to give anyone the idea. It's like, oh, well, we can just get all sorts with God. And then when we feel like it, we can get right and we'll experience that joy. You know, that, that is the case, but there's still going to be the consequences that come along with that. Amen. Now, if you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10... Uh, let's, let's see here. Look at verse 12. He says in verse 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So we want to be careful that, you know, we're, we're not people that thinking, oh, everything's fine, I can do whatever I want, uh, I'm not going to fall, everything's good, God's, I, I know, and, and, and nothing bad's ever going to happen. You know, if we get out of sorts with God, there's going to be consequences. You know, the Bible says, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I mean, that's what happened. That's, that's how that formula goes. You have sin. It's not sin, and when it is finished, you know, if God, you know if, unless God, you know, decides he's just going to, you know, give you some mercy and there's not going to be consequences. God can still give mercy. God can still give grace, but there's still going to be some form of death. Whatever way that shows up, you know, uh, it could come in different forms. <clears throat> if you would, actually, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, look back at verse, uh, uh, verse 10. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 10, Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now who are they talking about here? He's talking about Old Testament Israel when they were coming out of Egypt, when they were destroyed of the destroyer, the serpent, the plague, and those things. The generation that was supposed to go over into the, into the across Jordan into Jericho and take over the promised land. That's who this is referring to. And he's saying, look, these guys are our examples. Let's not be like them. And what were these people like? 
What were these people like that were destroyed of the destroyer? What, what did God call them in Deuteronomy and elsewhere? Stiff-necked. He said, and he, Moses even has said to him, you have been a rebellious people since the day I knew you. So, you know, getting right, you know, is it, great. There's joy in it, but it's not for everybody. Who is it for? The tender-hearted person. The person who's not stiff-necked. The person who has enough humility to bow the head and say, I'm wrong. Forgive me and get things right. <clears throat> That's why the Bible says, wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. It doesn't say he stands. It right. just says he thinks he does. Yeah. Right. It doesn't say it, this guy's got everything right. No, it just says he thinks he does. Right. And he's stiff-necked, and he doesn't want to get things right. <clears throat> so this message is you know, for the one, not the one who thinks he stands and everything's right, and he's got it all together. This message is for the one who is stu- maybe has stumbled, maybe has fallen but has a tender heart and is able to get right with God and they can experience that joy. Now turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You see, David, you know, despite all his failures, I mean, you look, at, you look at the life of David, this wasn't the only thing he did wrong. David did some other things wrong and things even worse than this. You know, things that weren't even necessarily out of a, a right motive. I mean, David is the one that, you know, committed adultery and murder, you know, but he... he was able to get grace from God. He did still suffered the consequences. Again, don't get me wrong. But why was it that David was able to recover when others couldn't? It's because David, I believe, at, at his core, was a humble man. He was a very humble man, and he had very humble beginnings. <clears throat> if, if you recall in 2 Samuel chapter 7, I'll read to you. The, uh, uh, the Bible says, Say unto uh, my servant David, I took thee from the sheep coat. These are David's humble beginnings. Just a shepherd boy. You know, He was the youngest in the family. And, you know, we, t- today we tend to romanticize being a shepherd. You know, we always have the oil painting, and it's a very beautiful scene. Being a shepherd back then was not a glorious job. You're away from the home. You're sleeping out under the, the weather. It was, it was the job that you gave to the person that you, you didn't want around all the time. It was the person that, you know, that was, that was the, the less desirable job. You know, we, we, we tend to think, oh, what a great experience that must have been. Well, go do it for years on end and, and see about that. You know, you guys are probably around Oklahoma, in this area, probably familiar a little bit with, with ranching and that kind of thing and the, and the beef and all that. That's hard work to go out there and, and handle livestock. And he here, you know, that's what David did. It was humble beginnings, you know, out there with, by himself with these animals. God said, I took thee from the sheep coat to be ruler over my people. And what was David's response in that same chapter? He said, who am I, O Lord, and what is my house that thou hast brought me thus far? You know, and that's the type of person that God's going to use. That's the type of person that God is going to give grace to. That's the type of person that's going to get to experience the joy of getting right, even if they get things wrong. The person who understands that they're nobody. And that, that you know, that uh, it's, it's all of the Lord. You know, David said, who am I? And what is my house? He always remembered his humble beginnings. He never lost sight of that. So I believe that David's humility, you know, him having that tender heart, like I was talking about earlier, him having that tender heart, that's what allowed him to take the first step in getting right in this passage where we were. That's what allowed him uh, to get right here. If you look there, I'll turn back there with you, in First Chron- uh, Chronicles chapter 13. First Chronicles chapter 13 and verse 11, it says, And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore that it place is called Perez Uzzah unto this day. And David was afraid of God <laughs> that, uh, that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself, the city, but carried it aside in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. So this is David. You know, that's a very humble thing for him to do. He didn't persist. He didn't say, you know, let's drag us out of the way. That we're going to get this done today. He said, whoa, something's wrong. We've messed up. You know, we made a mistake here. What, what did we do wrong? Let's stop what we're doing and, and evaluate and figure this out. And the only reason he was able to do that is because he was, again, a tender-hearted person. He was somebody who, had, who was not stiff-necked. He was a humble person who was willing to admit that he's wrong. And really, that's the first step. That's the first part of the process of experiencing the joy of getting right, is the ability to admit you're wrong. And that seems very simple, doesn't it? But often, it's very hard for us to do. It's very difficult for us sometimes to say, I'm the one that's wrong in a situation. And really, that's the difference, if you think about it, that's the difference between Saul and David. You recall King Saul, you know, he, he got out, ousted from the throne, and David got set up in his place. Now, if you think about the life of Saul, did he really do anything much worse than David? 
I mean, really, the, 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 the straw that broke the camel's back for Saul was when he went to, you know, he didn't kill all the Amorites. He left King Ahag, uh, Ahag, Agag, excuse me, alive. And Samuel had to come along and finish the job. I mean, was that really the worst thing in the world? I mean, was it adultery? Was it murder? Was it some of the things David's been guilty of? No. Well, what was the difference? Is when they got called on the carpet for it, it was their reaction. It showed what was in their heart. <laughs> Saul said, the people took of the spoil. You know, I have sinned, and if you read that passage, he says, I have sinned, you know, semicolon, and then blah, 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 a bunch of excuses. Right. Whereas when, da when David gets called on the carpet for a much worse sin that Saul had committed, of adultery and murder, when Nathan pointed that finger and said, thou art the man, what was David's response? And there was nothing about the people. Just, I have sinned, period. It was an ability for him to just admit that he was wrong. And that only comes from a person who has a humble heart, somebody who is not stiff-necked. And this is an, a, the most important step of, in this whole process of getting right and experiencing that joy of getting right is being able to admit you're wrong. And, you know, quite frankly, it's something that's just completely lacking today in so right. many people. You know, it's the difference between, you know, I, I don't consider myself an old man by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I, I shaved, I got the baby face going on, right? You know, but it's amazing to me that, you know, even as young as I am, just the next generation behind me, I'm already seeing this, that they have this inability to admit that they're wrong. And I don't know if it's, and maybe it's not a generational thing. Maybe it's a maturity thing. Maybe I'll get into my 40s and say, these 30-year-olds. Maybe I'll get into my 50s and say, ah, oh, those 40-year-olds. You know, maybe that's it. I don't know. Or maybe it really is that there's just this generation coming up in our country that just can't admit they're wrong. That's right. They'll say they feel bad. They'll say, you know, uh, I wish things had turned out differently, but you'll never hear these words. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. And this is something that has to be there. We have to have this ability to admit that we're wrong. Because here's the thing. We're all going to be wrong from time to time. And, you know, I do think it's a generational thing. Because here's the thing. I, I've had older, gener older uh, people come to me. And they've actually apologized for me to, about things that I had nothing to do with. They just wanted to clarify a situation. Like, hey, just want to know this happened. And I, I took care of it. And, and I'm sorry. I'm like, well, first of all, it didn't affect me. And two, I had no idea about it, but I appreciate you coming to me and talking to me about it. You know, apology accepted. <laughs> I didn't even know it was a thing, you know. But that was something that I've noticed in an older generation of people that, that, that understand this. And then I have other, I've noticed with the other younger people, you know, uh, that they, they just can't seem to take the mildest correction sometimes. Right. Just the, the, the slightest little rebuff, like, hey, you know, you need to work on this. Or would you mind even trying to put it politely, trying to put it, tactfully, blah, blah, blah. they just get all offended, and they blow you off, and they get upset. And that's, that's the wrong attitude to have. Right. Because if you'll never get right if you can't admit you're wrong. Amen. I mean, think about it. How can you get anything right if you don't think you're wrong? It's just like the lost person, that you got to get them lost before you can get them saved. Yeah. Well, I don't need to get saved. I'm, I'm a good person. Well, no, you're not a good person. You're wrong, and you need to acknowledge that. And really, that's the difference between, you know, maybe a generational thing or uh, it's the difference between Saul and David. But it's also the difference between a sincere apology and an insincere apology. A sincere apology, somebody's, you know, the person who's offended acknowledges the fact that they've offended somebody. You know, I, I remember, I'll never forget when I heard somebody, they, they'd offended somebody and it was getting dealt with. And, and this person was told, this is what you did. This is why I'm offended. And, and they, all we're looking for are you to be sorry and just to say you're sorry and get it right. And the person just couldn't do it. And here's what they said. Well, I'm sorry you're offended. That was their apology. I'm sorry you're offended. That's not an apology. That's almost like you're looking for an apology. from Maybe you should apologize to me for being offended. That's insincere. Because that's a person. Who, and why is it insincere? Because it's a person who cannot acknowledge that they're wrong and just admit that they're wrong. <clears throat> And here's the thing. Why is it so important? Because if you can't admit you're wrong, and if you would, turn over to Proverbs chapter 17. If you can't admit you're wrong, you're doomed to fail. Amen. You'll never get right. It's the first step. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 17, there in verse 20 it says, uh, He that hath a forward heart findeth no good, and he that uh, uh, hath a perverse uh, tongue falleth into mischief. That is not the verse I wanted whatsoever. So we're just going to move on. <laughs> we're running the wrong reference. I apologize. Proverbs 12, though, it says this. The way of a fool. Go to Proverbs 12, verse 15. I think that's where I needed to have you. 
Proverbs 12, verse 15, the Bible says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. He's right in his own eyes. He's, he's never wrong. He can never be told he's wrong. He can never accept the correction. And what, is it, what does the Bible say that? It, what does that make him? It makes him a fool. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he's a foolish person. He says, the way of the fool is right in his own eyes. You know, in his own eyes. Everybody else is going, buddy, you're, you're out to lunch. Right. You're, you're all sorts of wrong. But in his own eyes, no, I got it all right. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. The guy that's like willing to accept correction, almost wants it. Is saying, hey, show me how to, show me what I can do better. Show what I'm, you know, where am I wrong? How, what can I fix? How can I make this right? He's hearkening unto counsel. Go over to Proverbs chapter 21. What are we talking about this morning? We're talking about the process of getting right with God and experiencing the joy that comes with getting right with God. There's joy there. He says in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 2, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the heart. Now, it does say there every way of, the way of, uh, every way of man is right in his own eyes. Meaning, it's, this applies to everybody. You know, every man, every way of man. We're all going to be wrong from time to time because nobody, you know, unless I'm mistaken, <laughs> nobody in this room is perfect. Right. You know, <clears throat> and, and, and we're all going to be wrong. And, and I, I, can, I can hear the wives, you know, they're not saying, but they're like, amen. They're saying, <laughs> right? They know what it's like, right? <clears throat> yes, even us husbands, we will be wrong from time to time. Uh, but we all are going to be wrong. And we need to be prepared and be willing and be able to say, I'm wrong. You're right. I apologize. Let's make this right and move forward. So... <clears throat> Because here's the thing, everyone thinks they're right. You know, the, every, man, every way of man is right in his own eyes. Everyone thinks they're right until they're not. You know, oh, I thought I was, this was the right thing to do. You know, David was bringing back the ark and thought, well, this is the right thing to do. Yeah. This is where the ark belongs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was a good motive, but you're wrong, David, and you've got to get this right. And God, you know, it says there, God is pondering the heart. God is looking at the motive. God is, God is going to show us what's right and what's wrong where we need to get things right because here's the thing and i you know <clears throat> god doesn't demand perfection out of us because he's never going to get that right. we're, we're not perfect until we get to glory until we're new creatures in christ you know we're going to be flawed until the day we die so it would make no sense for god to demand that you be a perfect individual but what god does demand is obedience right. god wants you to obey he doesn't ask you to be perfect he just wants you to obey his word and, that, and he expects, as a result, humility. You know, God, God has every right to, uh, to demand obedience out of us and to expect some humility out of us. Amen. Because if we're going to try to obey this, this, this book and do what it says and live our lives in accordance to it, we're going to find out how often we're not right. That's right. Yeah. How often we, you know, even if we have everything right on the outside, every, if we got the, the family in line, you know, we got, you know, we got, our, we got our, our, you know, all our ducks in a row. Everyone can look it out from the outside and say, that is just ideal. You got it all together. We still have this heart. Right. And we still have this mind. Mm -hmm. And the things that go on in there, and we have to so often step back and say, whoa, where did that come from? Right. That wasn't right. That was wrong. Why did I think that? Why did I say that? Why do I feel that way? Forgive me, Lord. So God, again, he's not asking us to be perfect. He's just asking us to obey. And that's going to require some humility because we're all going to come up short. And we have to have that, that humility to, to admit that we're wrong. You say, well, that doesn't sound easy. And here's the thing, admitting you're wrong is not easy. Uh, no one ever said it was going to be easy. And here's what makes it hard to do. It's not just the fact that sometimes it goes against our pride. Sometimes it, it's just hard for us to, to verbalize those words. And, and, and we lack the humility sometimes. But, you know, admitting you're wrong isn't just some intellectual exercise where you examine a situation, determine who's right and wrong, and then just, you know, mouth the words, I'm sorry, and that's it. Often admitting you're wrong, uh, you know, requires some action on your part. You have to take steps. Yeah, you say, I'm wrong, I apologize, and then you have to take some steps beyond that to make things right. You have to, often you have to cease doing something. You know, it's, it's something that we've done or said. We have to stop saying things or stop doing certain things uh, in order to stop doing the wrong thing. It would be kind of like, uh, you know, it, I mean, just consider the foolishness of continuing to do the wrong thing, knowing you're doing the wrong thing, and expecting that everything's okay because I admit that it's the wrong thing. If I got, you know, in the car today and went out on the road and, and drove on the wrong side of the road and said, I don't belong over here. <laughs> this is so wrong. You know, this is against the law. Someone's going to get hurt. This is bad. But I just kept doing that. You know, I'm sorry. Is that, is that going to cut it? No, I got to get out of that lane and get over on the right-hand side. Right. You know, the, there's an action that has to follow. 
And that's what we see here in 1 Chronicles chapter 13. You know, David, he recognizes the fact that something's wrong. He says so in verse 13, So David brought not the ark home to himself, uh, to the city of David, but carried it aside in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark remained with the family of Obed-Edom in the house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom. David stopped what he was doing. He, he did not persist. And I know I kind of alluded to this earlier, but he, he didn't just, you know, drag Uzzah out of the way and continue to drive the cart and get another guy over there. Hey, take over for Uzzah. We're going to get this thing home. He stopped. There were some actions that were taken. That's, that's what part of admitting you're wrong is, is stop doing what you're doing that's wrong. <clears throat> it's not enough to just feel sorry. You actually have to take some steps. You see, David, he ceased doing what he was doing when he saw the negative consequences. When he saw, when he saw you know, he's bringing home the ark, the ox stumbles, David, Uzzah touches it, and now Uzzah's dead on the ground. He says, well, that, <laughs> that didn't go the way I expected. And what, he stopped doing it when the negative consequences came. And you would think so often that would be enough for us to stop doing the wrong thing and get things right. But so often it's not. So often we continue to do the wrong thing knowing the negative consequences that are coming. And I, I remember when I was writing this, it reminded me of a foreman I used to have when I worked in excavation, and he called it pushing the stupid button. Anyone ever heard that? Don't push the stupid button. Where you do something and you're like, why did I do that? Because you're stupid. You know, you push the stupid. They don't call it the stupid button because it's stupid. You know, it's because you're dumb for pushing it. You know? <laughs> well, what did you think was going to happen? You know, and what did you think was going to happen when you did that? Well, that. Well, why'd you do it? I don't know. Well, that sounds stupid. That's because it is. <clears throat> it's, it's dumb to, you know, a, a more elegant way to put it. You know, uh, he, you know, doing the same thing over and over the same way, expecting different results is the definition of insanity. Yeah. I forget who said right. it. But it's, it's the same concept. You know, if, if we continue to do the wrong thing, even though we might feel sorry about it, and even experience the negative consequences, you know, that's not enough. We have to stop what we're doing. Or we have to start doing something, start doing the right thing. <clears throat> so we see, first of all, that, you know, if we're going to get right with God, there's a joy that comes with getting right with God. You know, anybody that's ever done it can tell you that. I mean, think about just, you know, just in salvation. The joy that comes with knowing that you're at peace with your Savior. That you have you know, eternal security, you're born again, you're on your way to heaven, nothing's going to change that. You don't have to worry about hell or the penalty of sin ever again. That's a real peace. Amen. But even beyond that, in our own Christian lives where you know, we, we get backslidden, we get out of sorts with God, you know, <clears throat> hopefully it makes us feel bad. Hopefully it, you know, we, we don't enjoy it. And eventually we get to the place where we get right with God. Anybody who's done that knows that there's a real joy that comes with that. Say there's just there's just something about me not having to look over my shoulder, me not having to pull out of that parking lot and wondering if anybody recognized me, you know, me not having to, you know, whatever it is, you know, have somebody getting, you know, the joy of not having to worry about getting caught. Mm -hmm. The joy of not having to, you know, pay for the consequences of sin that always catch up to us. To know that there isn't just, you know, one day this is all gonna catch up to me and, 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 and I'm gonna have to pay the piper. There's a joy there. There's a joy with being right with God. And we should all want that. But what's the first step? You've got to admit you're wrong. Right. You've got to be willing to do that. What's the next step? Admit you're wrong and then take the actions necessary to get it right. Don't just say, oh, I'm sorry, and then continue to do it. You're not really sorry then. Right. True sorrow, you know, that's repentance. They, they, they stop doing what they're doing, and they get things right. <clears throat> so admitting you're wrong, you know, that entails ceasing the wrong actions. And that's what we saw David do. He stopped doing the wrong thing and tried to do the right thing. But here's the thing. Learning to do the right thing doesn't come easy. I mean, it sounds like it is. Like, well, just do the right thing. Well, sometimes we don't even know what the right thing is to do. But often, you know, they're, they're, that's a real trial. Sometimes doing the right thing is a hard thing to do. And if you would, go over to 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Because in David's instance, when you, if we were to go from... 1 Chronicles 13 to 15, it seems like the answer came to David real easy. David got it right real easy. If you're there in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, look at verse 1. It said, And David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a, for, a tent for it. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of the God, but the Levites. Of them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. So David gets it right. 
But what it, you know, if you, if you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to read the whole chapter, but I think we might have to. You know, invert, what happened between 13 and 15? Chapter 14 is what happened. But if we read chapter 14, nobody comes and tells David, hey, the Levites are supposed to do that. You don't see David getting out the Bible and reading it and figuring this out. It just happens. You have to ask yourself, who told David? It's not there in, in chapter 14. Uh, did he always know, maybe? That's kind of what I have, have leaned towards, you know, and I'm not trying to bash him or anything. Maybe he kind of already knew that when he got Uzzah down there. He was just trying to do things the easy way. I don't know. This is all speculation. Maybe he just forgot. You know, maybe he knew, but he forgot. Still not an excuse. But <clears throat> something happens in chapter 14 that I believe ties this all together. You see David trying to do the right thing, having these high expectations. He does it the wrong way. He suffers the consequences. He admits he's wrong, stops doing what he's doing, and then, and, and then all of a sudden, chapter 15, he's doing it the right way. There's this interlude in chapter 14, I believe, and that's where we kind of see what happened that God helped David to get things right. And, you know, it is a short chapter, and I, don't, I think I'm good on time, so we're just going to read this real quick. It says in chapter 14, verse 1, Now Hiram, the king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, timbers of cedar and masons and carpenters to build him a house, and David perceived that the Lord had confirmed him king over Israel, for his kingdom was lifted up on high because of uh, his people Israel. And David took more wives at Jerusalem, and David begat more sons and daughters. Now these are the names of his children, which he had in Jerusalem, Shammua, and Shobab, and Nathan, and Solomon, and Ibhar, and Elishua, and Lepilet, uh, and Noga, and Nepheg, and Jephiah, and Elishama, and uh, Beladiah, and Eliphalet. And when the Philistines heard, okay, this is where we want to focus in. When the Philistines heard that David was anointed king over all Israel, all the Philistines went up to seek David. Now, they weren't seeking him because they wanted to bring him gifts. They were going there because they wanted to kill him. They seek David, and David heard it and went out against them. And the Philistines came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines, and will thou deliver them to mine hand? And the Lord said unto him, Go up, for I will deliver them into thine hand. So they came to baal Perazim, and David smote them there. Then uh, David said, God hath broken in upon my enemies, by mine hand, like the breaking forth of waters. Therefore they called the name of that place baal Perazim. And when they had left their gods there, David went, gave a commandment, and they, burned, uh, uh, they, burned, uh, they were burned with fire. And the Philistines yet again spread themselves abroad in the valley. Therefore David inquired again of God, and God said to him, Go not up after them, turn away from them. And come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And it shall be when thou shalt hear a sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that thou shalt go out to battle, for God has gone before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And there, David there, therefore did as God commanded him, and they smote the host of the Philistines uh, from Gibeon even to Ge uh, Gezer. So what happened there? Here's what I want to point out, is that <clears throat> it's the same enemy. You know, it, it's the same enemy... In both instances, it's every, the first time the Philistines come up, they, spell, they spread themselves in the valley. David inquires of God. He says, go out and smite him, and he does it. The same enemy comes back again in the same valley. It's the same, exact same situation. God goes, or David goes to God and says, hey, shall I go and smite them? He says, go not up. Go over this way, over by the mulberry trees. And when you hear the sound of going, when you hear the wind in the trees, then go out, and I'll smite them. So, so what's going on there? Why does God give him this complete, it's, I mean, what's the difference? It's, nothing's changed except God's instructions. And I believe that's because that's where David's learning this lesson of doing things the way God wants them done. God's taking this opportunity to show him, look, I want you to win this victory, but I want you to do it my way. Mm -hmm. That God wants things done a certain way. <clears throat> you know, he, that, I believe this is where he learned this or he was reminded of it. And, and, and that God wants things are done a certain way. It's the same enemy in the same way. You know, I think sometimes God wants things done a certain way just to see if we'll do it his way. Yeah. I think that's what he's testing David. He's saying, look, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you to do it this way just to see if you'll do it. Because if you recall, there's been other instances in the Bible when, like, when the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the children of Israel were going to go up and uh, defeat the, the children of Ai. They didn't inquire of the Lord. That was their big mistake. They didn't check to see how God wanted things done. That was David's mistake when he brought back the, the ark. He doesn't ask how does God want this done until every, all the bad stuff had happened. And I think sometimes God just wants things done a certain way just to see if that's the way we'll do it. If we'll be what? Obedient. Amen. If we'll be obey his voice. <laughs> now, that also shows us another thing in this passage, that doing things God way, God's way isn't often the easy way. 
you know, fighting the Philistines was not easy. Maybe it would have been, maybe that going around the other way by the mulberry trees, you know, it's a longer trek. We've got to go over there. Then we've got to hide in these trees. We've got to wait for the wind. You know, it's, it's, it's more difficult. Why can't we just go out and fight them? Not that that's easy. But God's showing him, look, I want things done a certain way, and that way is not always going to be the easy way. And I think this is why people so often fail to get, the, to get things right. This is why so many Christians go without experiencing the joy of getting right. Because it's not easy. And we're just living in a culture where everything has to be easy. It's your way right away. Right? The way you want it. Just, you know, easy. It's just got to be the, the easiest way possible. This, we want just a, a, you know, a drive-through Christianity where it's just, you know, pick a meal and, and it's out in 10 minutes and less than that. Right? right. And that's, that's, the, that's not the Christian life. That's not getting right with God. Getting right with God isn't always easy. Yeah. Especially if you get saved later in life, you come with a bunch of baggage. You know, you've got these sins that you, you, you were into, and now you've got to get rid of this stuff, whatever it is. That's not always easy. Amen. You know, whatever it might be, you know, doing things the right way, is not, it's not easy to admit you're wrong. It's not easy to stop doing certain things. It's not easy to start doing the right thing. But that's the process of getting right with God. <clears throat> And if you would, uh, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Another real familiar verse. Because here's the thing. You know, we were talking about the stupid button earlier, right? You know, that button's there. We can push that all, all we want. <clears throat> but there is no easy button. Yeah. Don't let staples fool you. <laughs> you know, that, you can put that on your desk if you want. It's not going to work. <laughs> Boy, life's getting hard. This Christian life's hard. Where's that easy button? Nothing's happening because it's a gimmick, because it's not real. It's fake. Christian life is hard. You know what? And I'm glad that Christian's life's hard. Amen. I'm glad it's not just a cakewalk. I'm glad that it requires something out of us, that it takes character, that it takes you know, effort, because then you feel like you actually accomplished something. Amen. You get some right. sin out of your life, you're like, wow, I did that. Through the grace of God, I've gotten this sin out of my life. There's joy there with getting right with God. Amen. <clears throat> I mean, if it all came easy, there would be no joy with it. There's no satisfaction, and that's why we're living in a world where people are so unsatisfied, where everything's just coming easy to them. Yeah. Everything's just easy, easy come, easy go. <clears throat> Look here in 2 Timothy, uh, where are we going? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, he says, let me get over there, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 5, he says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. You know, here's the thing, there's no cutting corners with God. You can't cut corners in the Christian life. There's no easy way. You know, it'd be like, it'd be like the guy, you know, he's on a track. He's going to run a race. You know, he's down on the blocks. The gun goes off. And, you know, everyone starts down the track, and he just takes a hard left-hand turn, cuts across the middle of the track, <laughs> goes over there, runs across the finish line. Woo, I won. They're like, you cheated. You didn't win. Does it? Well, I got, I'm the first one across the line. I won. That's the goal, right? Yeah, but you have to make the loop, buddy. You got to go around. You got to stay in the track. Yeah. There's no cutting corners. There's no easy way in the Christian life. It doesn't exist. You have to strive lawfully, which means this. You're going to have to do it the hard way. Right. If you want to get right with God, if you want to have that joy, you're going to have to do things that are hard. That's right. Amen. <clears throat> so, you know, let me just close it up here. Wherever you are, Whatever area, you know, in your life, wherever you are in life, whatever area it is in your life that you insist in doing it your way and not God's way, that's where us is going to show up. You know, the Bible, there's not an area in your life that the Bible does not address. There's not a question you can't, or a concern you can't have that the Bible doesn't address. You know, and, and we could, you know, we could just touch on a few. You know, we think about, you know, what I think about often is the area of child rearing. You know, God has a very specific manner in which he tells us to raise our children. But we have a lot of different philosophies and ideas that are out there today say, no, do it this way. And they'll even, they'll even say, that's, that's totally wrong. Yeah. Don't do what the Bible says. That's, you know, you're going to scar your children. Right. You know? Well, see, sometimes that's a good thing. Like, I, want to, I want that in their memory, that if you do this, bad things happen. Amen. Yeah. That there's Amen. consequences for your actions. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing to, to, to you know, you know, put into a child's mind. Right. But the world will say, oh, don't do it that way. And if we allow ourselves to get, and this, again, this is just one area in life. You know, if we get, allow ourselves to get influenced, like, well, maybe, maybe doing things that way, like the Bible says, maybe that's kind of old school. 
you know, let's try this other way. Let's, let's try this positive reinforcement only way. And I'm for positive reinforcement. There's a time and place for it. But I'm saying that's all it ever is. And I've been around these parents, and, and their kids are complete brats. And, and the kids just throwing fit. I love you. Oh, don't do that. Why would you do that to me? Don't you see how that makes me feel? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know how it makes you feel. I, you know, it should make you feel furious sometimes. <laughs> But here's the thing, that's the area where you start to think, well, in, my, in this area of child rearing, I, uh, I'm going to go the world's way. That's where us is going to show up. That's, that's, good. Right. that's where you're going to have a wrecked life. That's where you're going to have heartbreak over some child who went, who went astray. You know, in marriages, you know, we want to do things, the, the, we want to do the things the way the Bible says. You know, wives are like, oh, I don't want to submit to my husband. The Bible says, wives, submit to your husbands. And, you know, <laughs> I thought about this, and I've used this illustration in the past. It's actually a true story. Think that, does that really happen in a Baptist church? Is there really anybody in the room, even here potentially, that would ever even think that? Yeah. I remember one, one preacher telling me, he preached that. He said, hey, the Bible says, wives, obey your husbands and all things. And, uh, you know, to be, to, to, to be obedient to their own husbands. And after the service, this sweet, godly lady came up, or appeared godly, and, said, and she said, look what I did. And she had taken a marker and crossed that out in her Bible. And she was proud of it. She's like, look what I did, preacher. I don't like that verse. You know what's going to happen? That's where us is going to show up in your life. That's where us is going to show up in the form of divorce. Yeah. Or a, you know, a bitter husband who doesn't want to be around you. Or, or whatever it is. A poor, failing marriage. That's what that's going to result in. <clears throat> well, you know, that's hard. He doesn't always do the right thing. It, it's hard. You know, my husband, he's, he's this, he's that. Yeah, you know what? You're probably right. It's, it's that way sometimes. But, you know, that's, that's part of the Christian life, doing things at heart, just trusting. <clears throat> so whatever area it is in our life where we're thinking, hey, I know better than God, that's where we're going to suffer. Where we're not going to say, you know what, actually God's way is better. We're refusing to say, you know what, I'm wrong, God's right, let me do it his way. That's where we're going to struggle. That's where, if, you know, we're going to suffer, we're going to fail, or at the very least, we're going to be inefficient. You know, at the very least. <clears throat> now we'll turn to one more place back in first chronicles chapter 15 say well this just i don't know i mean i read the bible i listen to the preaching i hear what everybody's telling me to do and it just sounds like god wants a lot and it's, it's hard to do and it is and god does but you know if you're saved the bible says you're not your own you're bought with the price Amen. glorify right. therefore god in your bodies right. and god has every right to make every demand of you that he does Amen. because you're his and thank God for that. Thank God that we're his. I wouldn't want to be anybody else's. <clears throat> but here's the thing. You know, God does ask a lot, but God also helps. Amen. I think sometimes we lose sight of that. Yeah. We forget that, you know, yeah, God asks us to do a lot of hard things, but a lot of times God steps in and he helps. That's right. And that's exactly what you see here in First Chronicles uh, chapter 15. You know, David figures it out, <clears throat> you know, and says, oh, we got to do it this way. You know, it's a lot easier to just put it on the cart and let the ox drag it up there. You know, let some beast of burden do all the heavy labor. Rather than get the Levites, you know, and get them in all the right apparel and get them all organized and, you know, figure out who's going to stand where. And then they got to pick that thing up. I mean, it's plated in gold. I mean, that's heavy stuff, right? I mean, bearing the ark was, I mean, when you, when you read that, you say, that must have been pretty heavy to do. They had the staffs there. They're, they're trying to bear this thing up. But when we're trying to do it God's way, when we're trying to do things the hard way, even, you know, when God asks us to do it these ways, God steps in and he helps. If you would, look there in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 25. It says, So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went up to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. So they go to do it the right way, right? And what happens in verse 26? And it came to pass when God, uh, when God helped the Levites <clears throat> that, uh, that bear the ark and the singers. God looks down and says, Oh, you're doing it the right way. You're doing it the way I told you. And it's hard for you to do it. I can see that it's difficult for you. Let me step in there and help you. You know, I think those, those, those Levites, when they started doing that, that all of a sudden that ark was just light as a feather. God was just going, whoop. Yeah. Let me help you with that. Yeah. Uh, thanks for doing it my way. I appreciate that. I'm glad you're obedient. <clears throat> because here's the thing. You'll say, well, it's a hard way. Why should I want to get right? Why should, what, is it really that important for me to experience the joy of getting right with God? It is. Because God does all of this for our own good. 
You know, God's just not making up all these rules and putting all these, you know, things on us just because he, he just, <laughs> just up there just want to watch him struggle. Right. No, because it's, it's good for us Amen. to be obedient. He's watching out for us. He's got our best interests in mind. So that's my admonition to you this morning is, you know, don't miss out on the joy of getting right. If you're out of sorts with another person even or God or whoever it is or, you know, even in your own heart, maybe there's just some area in your life where it's not right. You're wrong. Just be willing to admit that and just take the next step. Stop doing what, you're, what you shouldn't be doing. Start doing what you should be doing. And you know what? <clears throat> when you, God sees that, he'll step in and he'll help you. And you'll get to experience the joy of getting right. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for um, the many examples in the Bible of men who, Lord, who came up short, but were still mightily used of you despite their, our, their own shortcomings, Lord. And thank you for the example of uh, those men uh, having a, a humble heart, a, a, a soft heart, Lord, that were willing to accept correction and, Lord, and to get things right. Lord, help us to have, be that same type of people, people that are willing to uh, understand that we, we mess up, we slip up, but Lord, when it happens, that we'll, we're willing to, to make things right and keep things right. And Lord, I just pray that you would uh, be with the soul winning this afternoon and bring us back this evening. We ask in Christ's name, amen. amen. All right, so we'll go ahead and sing.